Museum, Prince Edward Island, 150 series of talks, and uh, uh, it's gone by very quickly. We've moved on into the 20th century. In earlier talks, we were largely talking about, uh, hearing talks about the 19th century, various aspects of it. And we're pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Matt McRae uh, this evening, and I'll introduce him shortly. Uh, I just, uh, I think I've, in fact, I think I'll introduce you now. And the, the, these, <laughs> these I will give later, the, the announcements. Uh, we'll start uh, uh, right away. Uh, I met uh, Matt only a couple of years ago. You've been back on the island since 2019 That's right. as the executive director of the Prince Edward Island Museum and Heritage Foundation. But it is a case of coming back to the island for uh, Matt was born in Charlottetown and went to Charlottetown schools, I presume, and on to the University of Prince Edward Island. And then he did uh, PhD studies in Canadian history at Western University in London, Ontario. Now, uh, his connections on Prince Edward Island, he has Kinkora connections. Uh, it's through your... My grandmother. Your grandmother, yes. So <laughs> he, he, he feels at home in this particular part. World as well. Um, so he, he, uh, his studies at uh, Western uh, uh, since have focused on collective memory in Canada, including the Prince Edward Island centennial celebrations. And that's what he's going to talk about tonight celebrating the cradle, nationalism, tourism, and the 1964 and 1973 centennial, centennials on Prince Edward Island. So, welcome, Matthew, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doug, for the lovely introduction, and thank you everyone for coming <coughs> tonight. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I've got the mic turned on, but just making sure it's not. Uh, is, is it worth is the mic working? Yeah. It's working, but it could be up a bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's my response. Go ahead. We'll crank it a bit. Yeah. You'll all have to put up with my voice. Um, I'll also try to. Oh, well, I guess I don't have to put that. That sounds more than loud enough. Um, so yeah. So uh, just to begin, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that the land that we're all gathered on here today is the ancestral territory of, of the Mi'kmaq and uh, is part of the wider territory of Mi'kma'ki that encompasses much of the Atlantic provinces. Um, and uh, if you haven't already, uh, I encourage you to get connected with the indigenous community here on Prince Edward Island, uh, Lennox Island, which isn't too far from here, closer than it is to me in Charlottetown, of course offers cultural experiences that uh, I haven't attended, but I've had several colleagues tell me are very good, very excellent to attend. Um, you can also read, uh, there's the, the, of course, the report, the Residential Schools, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, uh, which uh, <coughs> is a difficult read, I'll be honest, but a worthwhile one. And the same goes for the report on missing and murdered indigenous women. And just on a personal note, a uh, book I read this year that was quite good, it's not island history, but it's, if you are looking for a primer on kind of uh, indigenous history and indigenous settler relations, uh, the Valley of the Bird Tail, which is about a valley in Manitoba where a reserve and a settler community live directly across the river from one another. Uh, it's an excellent little book and I think it's available everywhere now. So uh, I recommend to read. Uh, with that aside, we'll move on to the talk itself, Celebrating the Cradle, Nationalism, Tourism, and the 1964 and 1973 Centennials on Prince Edward Island. It's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, I think it covers everything. Uh, so a bit about me. Uh, this is me about 23, 24 years ago. Uh, full disclosure, I was a volunteer of Confederation. Not back in 1864, but on the streets of Charlottetown while I was doing my undergrad at UPEI. 
I usually played Thomas Darcy McGee, the Irish Father of Confederation, Minister of Agriculture and Immigration for the United Parliament of Upper Lower Canada. Um, I also did John A. MacDonald uh, in a pinch and uh, was occasionally Colonel John Hamilton. Great. So uh, the centennials and commemoration and confederation has kind of been milling about in my life since my teenage years at the very least, uh, if we just ignore you know, the ambiance of PEI prior to that. Uh, so some of this dog I already talked about, I became executive director. I moved back to PEI in 2019 as the curator of history for the PEI Museum and Heritage Foundation. But quickly the fools made me executive director in September of 2020. Uh, and uh, since then I've been trying to run the sites. Uh, but I worked previously at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, Manitoba for about seven years and had other museum experience uh, as well, either in consulting or working uh, you know, entry-level jobs at several other institutions before that. So, uh, but my, my trade, I am a historian. That's what I studied in school. Um, I focused on Canadian history, and I did, we mentioned the PhD, but I also did an MA in history at Carleton University in Ottawa, and that MA focused on the centennials and focused on tourism on PEI from 1939 to 1973, kind of using the centennials and those celebrations as a bookend to kind of take a snapshot of what tourism and what, uh, you know, the, the, I guess, the, the situation was looking like. Um, 1939, of course, was actually the 75th anniversary of the Charlottetown Conference, and there was a celebration for a week-long celebration in 1939. Uh, just before the start of September 1939. And so literally, they had the celebration, and then everyone's like, oh, I guess we're at war now. Mm -hmm. So it was a very different affair back then, and it didn't lead to a surge in tourism or development, because all of that was put on hold for a number of years. But then again, in 1964, they celebrated the centennial of the Charlotte Conference, finally 1973, where my master's thesis ends off was the celebration of the, what we're now celebrating, the sesquicentennial, that was the centennial of the island joining confederation. So, I think that's probably enough about me. Um, moving forward, what are we going to talk about in this uh, little talk? Well, we're going to start by looking at anti-modernism and the development of PEI tourism, kind of where it came from. We're not going to spend too much on time on that. There is some uh, uh, I've, I hear there's someone coming next week who will have some things to say about the growth of PEI tourism, but I'll just provide a little bit of context. Um, next up is how that tourism connects into the new nationalism that appeared in Canada in the 1960s and this kind of centennial impulse, or as uh, historian Dr. Ed McDonald has called it, uh, centennialitis. Uh, he said the entire country was kind of struck with this affliction of centennialitis. Um, then we'll talk about the 1964 celebrations. We'll talk about how those kind of um, really cemented the notion in uh, islanders and, for that matter, the federal government, that tourism could be part of a successful economic planning strategy and a way to bring modern, con not convenience, this is the wrong word, but basically bring um, an economic modernity to the island. Uh, then we'll talk about how that played into the 1973 celebrations and how it also, while well, the 1973 celebrations on paper were a huge success, also created this, um, this conflict within uh, island society uh, you know, that was much larger than the 73 celebrations, but they kind of became almost a stage for that debated discussion about what the island identity should be. And then last but not least, we might talk about what did it all mean. I am not promising to be able to answer that question uh, tonight, but we can certainly discuss it. So here's a book that if you want to learn all about tourism, you should read. It's The Summer Trade. It just came out this year. It's by Dr. Ed McDonald and Dr. Al McCachran. Ed will be giving a talk, I think, on tourism and its development uh, next week. So I will not go too far on this, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, tourism, because it's very important to understand our centennials. I mean, uh, without tourism, our centennials, I think, they might have still happened, but they would have been very different 
um, I think, beasts than they became. So, first to understand, tourism on BEI kind of started in the late 1890s. Uh, and that's not unusual. Tourism was kind of starting to develop at that time, but it really took off after the development of the car. Before that, there were some resort hotels on PEI. Um, the, the, the PEI Railway would advertise uh, and try to attract tourists. Interestingly, though, the PEI Railway, as Ed has pointed out, often advertised not for coastal places because it ran through the middle of the province, but it advertised so you're going to see great hunting and fishing and, and other things that were more on the interior. So kind of an interesting thing that at that point they weren't advertising for the beaches were all known for. But as, that, as the car started to become more dominant, and as uh, island politicians started to move to paved roads, what we saw was that tourism really started to take off here in PEI. Um, when the first car ferry, after the ban on cars ended in 1919, and the first car ferry started to roll vehicles onto the island, uh, it became more and more common for uh, to see tourists kind of, uh, you know, initially around Cavendish following that Anna Montgomery, but gradually the Confederation Chamber in Charlottetown also became another attractive site. Um, and in 1939, of course, as I said, there was kind of a hold on that tourism growth because efforts were turned towards the war. But after that, uh, it resumed. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that um, this was a this this growth was a international phenomenon. North America in general, especially in the post-war area, was experiencing tourism growth. Um, and I'll just give you some numbers here to kind of show you here. So you can see this is not by any means the number of tourists, but it's the total number of passengers in the 1950s until 1960. And you can see that those numbers are you know they basically double the number of passengers and the number of vehicles more than doubled. So you can see uh, more and more people are coming, and more and more people are coming by car. Some of these, of course, will be islanders. Some of these will be you know, uh, all kinds of goods being shipped across the island. So this is by no means the total number of tourists. That's smaller. But, and it was very hard to calculate, because there wasn't really any way to calculate tourist numbers back then that was terribly accurate. But all the signs pointed towards constant growth. Um, and the islands reacted to this kind of uh, with a set mixed sense. There was certainly tourism boosters. There was tourism associations and organizations formed. The, the Innkeepers Association uh, was formed in 1946 and became officially incorporated as an, by an act of the legislature in 1947. It was turned into the Tourist Association uh, in, or the Tourism Association in 1957. Uh, kind of reflected the fact that it no longer was just innkeepers who were members of the association, but all kinds of people functioning throughout the tourism industry. And that's something I think that made it difficult for some island politicians and islanders to get their head around, was the tourism industry wasn't something like farming, where you had farms, or something like fishing, where you had, you know, you had fishing vessels, and you, you, it was a centralized industry. Because tourism encompassed restaurants, hotels, it encompassed all these different things, these disparate parts. Um, and kind of required everybody to participate. So it was very hard for people to know where to focus their energy, but also there was kind of a feeling of annoyance of that it was taking people away from the real work on the island, like farming and fishing and just being islanders. And there's a letter I remember in my research I found from Walter Shaw, um, the premier in 1944. He'd been invited to a national tourism conference uh, to discuss the tour plans for attracting tourists to Canada and throughout Canada after the war. And his response was essentially to decline, saying that um, we, are we, we're already getting, here's the quote, uh, that the island is getting many, as many or more tourists than we can possibly accommodate. Uh, and he spoke in the letter of tourists insisting on coming to PEI. So you get kind of the sense that now, with that said, there's no doubt that Walter Shaw was also positioning himself, because the letter also says, unless we're going to get some more money from the federal government, I don't really see how we can spend our time on this. So there's obviously a little bit of that game being played where we're looking for it. So, and Walter Shaw did, of course, commit money to the tourism industry. He was the premier that first put in loans for accommodations that, come, that uh, people who were building hotels and motels and bed and breakfast could get an accommodation loan to help improve their facilities. 
because as much as tourists wanted to see the past, you know, in PEI, that was part of the appeal, they also want to make sure the toilet's flushed. I mean, that was very important. And I think that brings me to the next point is anti-modernity, because why were people coming to the island? What was it about the island that actually attracted people? And I think, uh, you know, you can see a bit of an answer right here in this picture, right? You've got these beautiful farm fields. You can see the dunes and the beaches up beyond. Oh, it has a switch. I wonder if that's that's strange. Why is it? Oh, nope, there we go. And on my screen, it's back here. So it's going to go flippy flip. Apparently delays for a second. Let's see? All right. It's playing games with me now. Well, look at that. When I switch back, it does that. Interesting. OK, we'll leave it and uh, see how this goes. So yeah, you can see the picture there, you kind of see the old farmhouse. I think that um, many, many people visiting, uh, Prince of Island, of course, the reason for this wasn't so much because of a sense of islanders wanting to preserve the past more than people in other places, but uh, from a sense of economic stagnation, really. We didn't have money to replace our old buildings there. And, and I think there just wasn't, that wasn't the ethos here. But islanders wouldn't have seen themselves necessarily as anti-modern. But this garden myth, which is described by uh, Dr. Milne uh, many years ago, he calls it the garden myth. And it's this notion that the island was an island of yeoman farmers who all you know, plowed the soil. And that was, that was the essence of what PEI was. It was the garden of the gulf. It was the million acre farm. It was that. And, and, and there, like all myths, there's truth in that myth. It's not that it is. And when I say myth, I don't mean it in terms that there isn't uh, a farming legacy here in PEI. My grandfather in Kinkora, or my great grandfather in Kinkora, Joseph Trainer, was a farmer himself. And you know, I think most islanders have, uh, if they have a couple of generations here on the island, there's probably a farmer somewhere in there. So it's not that it's untrue, but it's simply that it is an interpretation and a focus uh, that is used to tell a story about who we are. And in this case, we're the Garden Province. And I think for most islanders, like for example, Walter Shaw was also famous for believing that farmers were the real islanders. And he said, if the farmers go cuckoo like the people in the towns, goodbye Prince Edward Island. That was an actual quote <laughs> for Walter Shaw. So you get the idea, again, of that sense. But I think that what happened is tourism boosters latched onto this because they realized that's why people were coming here. Because it didn't look like Montreal or Toronto or Halifax or New York. It didn't look like you know, it was, it was very different. And I'll just give you two quotes here to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, a brochure from 1956 uh, that was made here on Prince of Island by <coughs> the then George Fraser, the director of the Travel Bureau, who used his own kids in his photographs and took the pictures himself and would literally, at the, I guess, at the kitchen table at night, cut out the brochures and put it all together and then send it to the screen printers. He did it all at the time because it was a very small operation. He said, going to Prince Edward Island offers a complete, restful, memorable change, almost like going to a different world. But you don't need a spaceship to get there. You can reach Prince Edward Island quickly and inexpensively by bus, train, boat, car, or plane. This is Canada at its best. It is the garden province, the Eden spot, the unspoiled, idyllic island with the finest uncrowded beaches on the North Atlantic coast and refreshing water to boot. Uh, averaging 70 degrees Fahrenheit all summer. We all agree that's true, right? Um, wherever you go, get to Prince Edward Island this year. So that was in 1956. And so just to give you an idea how enduring that sales pitch was, um, is that there's an article in 1970, or in the early 1970s, made in anticipation of the 1973 centennial. It was a travel article about visiting PEI. And here's what the travel journalist had to say. He said, Prince Edward Island looks like a child's farm set. Any minute you can expect a giant hand, you expect a giant hand to reach through the sky and set down another horsey next to the red barn. <laughs> it is the kind of place where you have to get out of the car every now and then and just stroll through the fields because they are not just ordinary fields. They are the meadows of one's own childhood, riotous with color, with the blue of cornflowers, the red of devil's paintbrush, the yellow of buttercup, and black-eyed Susan. And in August they are bursting with raspberries as well. So I think that you know, I think that line there, there in the meadows of one's own childhood, really captures, and I think any islander can express that, but what's fascinating to me is that it's not just people who grew up on PEI who feel that, it's people who come here who have never been here before. 
Um, and I think that uh, people travel from all over the world to have that feeling of walking through an island field. And it's because there is that sense of uh, the, you know, of that this is somehow your past, and this is somehow a past. And I think that that garden myth is very critical in marketing the island, and I'm sure Dr. Ed will talk more about that, but let's see if we can get, there we go, why that connects to the new nationalism and the centennial. Anybody recognize this picture? Mm -hmm. Any uh, hands up? 64, that's right. That's, it's a little fuzzy there. It's not, for some reason, it's turning out a little more fuzzy on the screen, but that's Queen Elizabeth uh, in front of the Confederation Center accepting uh, flowers from uh, Terry, I can't remember her last name, but, um, but uh, when she came to officially open the Confederation Center. Now, the new nationalism is a term that historians have applied to kind of the surge in uh, Canadian patriotism and national sentiment that happened in the 1960s. Um, you can think of, uh, those of you who remember, uh, one of Trudeau's ministers in the local government was Walter Gordon. And uh, he became extremely popular when he advocated for less foreign intervention in the, island, in the Canadian economy, uh, particularly by foreign greed U.S. intervention in the UK economy. And part of this was coming because the 1960s were an interesting kind of pivot point for Canadian identity. Up until that point, Canada had been in the eyes of most of the white settler population, apart from French-speaking Quebec, had been a British country. It was a country that, if, even if there was large portions of the population, Ukrainian, Polish, uh, other, you know, uh, Greek, there was other groups, but they all, this was part of the British Empire, and Britain, represented by the Queen, was where our identity lay. But the 1960s, as that multiculturalism kind of started to really take root, and after the war, and the fact that the British Empire was now receding into the past, uh, Canada was kind of cast adrift a bit, looking for, well, who are we then? Are we still British? Are we going to claim to that? Are we going to do something else? And there was a debate happening. There was the flag debate about getting a new flag. This was when you started to see a lot of these national symbols that were distinctly Canadian. You know, the removal of the Union Jack and things like that start to happen. Um, and so this new nationalism meant that uh, Canadians were really looking for um, their identity. And they were also looking for their identity in the face of threats because, of course, the fear uh, for many of Canada's kind of cultural elite was that we would be swallowed up by the United States if we didn't have Britain to hang on to as kind of our identifier. The other fear, of course, was uh, Quebec separatism, that we would, Canada would break up unless there was a strong counterweight to Quebec nationalism as it developed, as Charles de Gaulle showed up and said, Vive Quebec Libre in Montreal and all those kind of fun things. Uh, Canadians were looking around for something to celebrate uh, that they could say was a stick of the Canadian. And lo and behold, uh, the timing was just right for, uh, well, 18, 1964. This was all kind of taking place when Frank McKinnon, uh, who was, of course, a scholar and a, I guess, for lack of a word, kind of a renaissance man here on Prince of Rye Island, uh, writer of many history books uh, with Prince of Wales, or Saint, was he with Prince, Prince of Wales? Wales? Prince, Prince of Wales, Wales. thank you. Wales. I had a moment there. So Frank McKinnon, of course, was a great advocate for celebrating the Father's Confederation and their meeting here in 1964. Uh, now, what's interesting, of course, is the 1864 celebration, by that time, PI had already done a pretty good job of marking itself as the birthplace of Confederation. There was a uh, fair bit of it um, in previous literature. Usually they say, you know, well, you come here, you have some lobster, you go to the North Shore of the beach, but also make sure you stop by, you know, Province House. Make sure you stop by and take a look and take a moment to consider the, you know, the, the past. So this was a pretty standard kind of thing. It was already in there, but it wasn't necessarily a fait accompli that 1964 would be a big celebration. Um, that wasn't something that necessarily had to happen. Um, in fact, there was challengers going on at the time. Um, you gotta understand, centennials were very common. Celebrations were happening all over the place. But even in 19, the 19, early 1960s, there were some Nova Scotia, uh, apparently one of their politicians suggested that really the true celebration should be Halifax because probably the discussions there were more important. 
because of course the fathers had continued on to Halifax and then to St. John and then off to uh, Quebec City after that. Um, and there was of course uh, Quebec itself which said, well really Gaspé should be because that's where Cartier first landed. So that's really the start of Canada as far as we're concerned. So that's where we should be celebrating. So there was this kind of um, debate going on and there's this great letter I discovered. I'm going to break out my glasses because I turned 45 and all of a sudden it became hard to read close up. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, let's see here. So, McKinnon uh, wrote a letter to the Deputy Minister of Tourism, kind of, because they were trying to make the case to the federal government why they should receive federal funding. And this was part of it, too, was the realization we can get some federal funds here to celebrate this and make this not just a local PEI centennial, but a national centennial, right? There have been lots of centennials in the past. Centennials have been happening since at least the 1880s when they had the Loyalist Centennial in, uh, in St. John, New Brunswick. And in 1908, they had a centennial of Samuel de Champlain, or it was actually the quadricentennial Samuel de Champlain arriving in Quebec City. And so there was a, these centennials that occurred, um, and I mentioned the 1939 celebration, but they wanted to make this national. They wanted to have the stamp of approval to make this kind of an official thing. And they said, so he wrote this letter, and he had this list of refutations to other claims. He said, for example, in refer reference to Gaspé, he said, one can hardly refer to a landing place as a birthplace. And then he says, uh, and he says, anyway, Cartier landed on Prince of Island first. <laughs> and then he says, and besides, Leif Erikson landed before Cartier. Uh, and the next line is, the birthplace is the place where the first plans for Canada were made, and the idea of union was officially suggested, and that's Charlottetown. And, and so he just has these kind of this list of reasons. I won't read them all, but he goes on. And, you know, and it really kind of uh, speaks, I think, to, to this argument that the Islanders felt they had to make to make sure that this was the case. And when the Centennial Commission was created uh, and it was put together to plan the Centennial, well, their aim was, let's them and read this off as follows, to register the 1960, their aim, to register the 1964 PEI Centennial as a national cause for celebration. Promotionally, we must keep in mind its significance for all Canadians, that it is a birthday party in which the whole country should be deeply involved. Historically and romantically, it should contribute to the events scheduled for 1967, which of course would be the centennial of Confederation actually taking place, as it did to the events of 1867, and then this is all caps. But in the beginning was Charlottetown. Here is the valid Canadian historic shrine. So that's it. They are literally attempting to make sure that Charlottetown is recognized as a national shrine, as kind of the spiritual center of Canada, is what this goal is. And they're very aware they're doing that, these planners. This is all part of the plan. Uh, there's a term, uh, academic term, um, in tourism studies called site sacralization, which is when you take a site and you make it kind of something more than, you know, it is just perhaps every day to people walking by, it becomes a sacred site. You know, an, exa an excellent example is the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, right? It's behind glass, it's a big, everyone's there taking pictures of it, uh, it's become this kind of almost sacred site. When you go to Paris, you go see the Mona Lisa. When you come to PEI, you go to the Confederation Chamber. You might also go to Green Gable, some would argue that's your sacred site too, but you get the basic idea. Now, the interesting thing about commemoration, though, and this is, I'm gonna, I'm, I promise I won't get too academic here, but there's a scholar I really enjoy called John Bognar, and he talks about what he calls um, official uh, commemoration, and then he talks about commemoration from below. So he talks about um, there's these two levels you have. So official commemoration is really focused on unity, on cohesion, on like on big interest, the interests of, I guess, the, uh, the financial or the political elite, what they would like to see, the story they want to see told. But then you have this vernacular, that he calls it the vernacular uh, interpretation, and that comes from the people who that's important to, that it connects to their lives in some way. And often those two com uh, modes of commemoration can clash, obviously. Sometimes they can also, though, come together for the same goal. And largely in 1964, it seemed that the vernacular um, and, the, uh, and the official 
kind of came together and agreed, for the most part, on what needed to be done and why. Because, of course, the 1964 celebrations were a year long and they were a huge success. Uh, here you've got a picture of uh, the Queen, at, again, this time in the Confederation Center for the official opening. Um, also, I think it's neat to see behind her there is uh, singer Portia White, uh, one of the, uh, the, from Nova Scotia. She was one of the first black singers to hit it big. And something you'll notice about 1964, and for that matter 1973, is that there wasn't really a lot of room made for anybody other than, like it was very much a story of white Canadians. And again, that, that garden myth is about white settler uh, Canadians. That's really where the focus lay. And so other groups, whether it was indigenous or black or even Acadians, didn't really factor in very strongly to these stories or what was being told, but you still saw opportunities, uh, for example, the Confederation Center where there was, you know, performers from all over the world, brought, or all over Canada brought in and from different walks of life for people to still get their voices heard in there uh, and talk about that. And we'll see a bit more of that as we go on. So you can see uh, the Confederation Center, of course, would have been the, the biggest kind of piece of the pie and perhaps the largest piece of that official commemoration. And that took the form of this giant center. It cost $5.6 million. Uh, Parliament voted that 15 cents per head of population from across Canada would be put towards the center. Uh, but it, it was built on time and on budget. It was actually finished in May of 1964, just in time for the summer season, and the summer performances. And then the Queen came and opened it in October of 1964, officially. I, of course, had already run a full summer season at that point, but was still quite, uh, you know, uh, quite an event, uh, many people remember. And that would have been the biggest thing, but that was just one part. Uh, over $400,000 were spent on promotion and preparation and planning for this event. Uh, and there was literally hundreds of volunteers. And the official planning committee consisted of the, it was just a who's who list of uh, island elites. You had the Peaks, you had the Yos, you had um, you know, uh, several families of the Shahs. And the, there was just all the families were there that you would recognize as kind of, you know, if there was a prominent family from your part of the island, it was probably, there was probably a member on the committee. And it was really just kind of a, an effort across the province. Now, the interesting thing was, of course, what they did is they also organized these community celebrations in 1964. Every community on PEI that was willing to do so got a community day. They got some funding and some support from the Central Centennial Commission, and they would organize these events. Um, and, uh, and they would have a day, and they would, they would actually say, they, we have found these letters where they're saying, tell us what you want to do with your day, and we'll help you celebrate it. And that was kind of this idea. Uh, it was kind of a precursor to 1967 when they had the centennial funding where they said, what does your community want to build to honor the centennial? And of course, we had a whole slew of centennial hockey rinks. Mm -hmm. uh, it was probably the big thing. Uh, and that's, that's actually, there's some great, um, some great articles about uh, centennial hockey rinks and, and, you know, how, and this is where the, I think the vernacular comes in because how people wanted to celebrate the centennial didn't always mesh exactly with uh, what people wanted to do, um, or what the officials wanted to do. Uh, a few examples, actually, the town of Victoria by the Sea, um, two rival centennial commissions formed and fought each other about what to do with the funding. And there was these letters back with the main centennial commission in Charlottetown going, look, just you guys figure it out, please. Um, that was one example. Another one was the town of Cardigan who decided, we'd like to roast an entire ox. But we're not sure how to do that. We just think it's going to be a really big draw that, like, well, who else has roasted an ox? And then my favorite part was finding that the, the, the Central Commission in Charlottetown was sending these letters out to uh, meatpacking plants and all and other communities that it's like, I heard you had a roast. Can you please tell us how you did it? And I just found this correspondence, and one of my favorite letters came from the town of Moncton because they had cooked an entire donkey <laughs> and so they sent they sent a little card here. Oh, it's not changing. So there we go. <laughs> 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 
So I, I know that's not connected to PEI, but I still found the whole thing just completely hilarious. <laughs> And, and just fascinating that this is what was going on. Uh, let's see here. So I would say too, though, what was very interesting, I'm going to put my glasses back on here again for this quote, but uh, was the Acadian community, of course, in Wellington was also invited to participate. Uh, and they were, so on June, I'm going to read here, on June 15, 1963, Cyrus F. Gallant, a commissioner in the village, replied to Centennial Committee's general call and said, I for sure and other commissioners are not too familiar with what we should do for the occasion so unique. Um, it was very clear in the letters that English was not their first language and they really struggled and they kept su sending suggestions, but they finally said, um, he said, as chairman of our village, I must confess I have done nothing in respect to our Centennial program. This project is too large a shoe for my foot and the commissioners are very, very busy with their daily work. It's true you furnished us with literature, to explain, but to explain its contents is beyond my ability to do. Uh, and so I think uh, there were groups on the island that did not feel perhaps as uh, as much a stake uh, in the centennial celebrations and couldn't quite figure out what they wanted to do. Now that said, there is also, an, or, or just didn't feel it was really that important to them, there was also groups, um, because one thing that a lot of writing I found talked about was cultivating what they called the spirit of 64. <clears throat> and this, this was this idea that there was this spirit of celebrating 1864, 1964, and really making people aware. And I found one letter that was written by uh, Leona Ross, and she was chair of the Children's Events Committee. So they organized all these kinds of events for children across the province. And she described the following experience in her final report to the Centennial Committee. She said, one inspiring experience I shall always remember. I had taken a busload of children from the rehabilitation center on a tour of the wild animal park at Rustico. Sir, bet you didn't know there was a wild animal park at Rustico. Oh, yes. <laughs> Some people remember. Uh, I, uh, I, we served them a picnic, supper at Cavendish, and then took them to Green Gables. I was exhausted when we started homeward, homeward, yet here were children in braces, crutches, and wheelchairs singing lustily and happily as the bus rumbled along. Suddenly they burst with fervor into this land is your land. I could offer them so little when they needed so much, but here was the nucleus of all we had hoped for in the centennial year, the conscious, conscious realization by our young people that this was their heritage, this was their country, this was their opportunity and challenge. So you can see that there were people working here who very truly believed in the mission and thought it could inspire the next generation to build a better country and that it could really connect people with their past and kind of move them along. So there was some really, I, I'm not trying to say that it was all cynical or everyone was listening, but there was definitely um, a lot of enthusiasm. So in the wake of this, the, the, of the events of that year, it was a huge success. Um, oh, let's go back again before we get to the next slide. I'm not sure why it's giving that. There we go. So, of course, here we have Premier Campbell, elected in the mid-1960s after the celebration in 1964, I think it was 1966, he was elected. Um, but one of the things that happened in the wake is that the, it was a huge hit. The, there was a larger number of tourists that came than ever before in the summer of 1964, uh, and more money was made. The centennial was a huge success. The Confederation Center was a huge success. Now the province had this larger than ever, very modern building in the middle of it. And so it really kind of encouraged the province to start thinking, how can we use tourism to jumpstart our economy even more? Uh, and this, of course, was already starting to happen. Um, I think that, uh, and something I should talk about too, was the fact that in 1964, as part of the centennial, the government passed the Flag Act, giving us the Prince of Island flag. They passed the Coat of Arms Act, giving us the Coat of Arms of Prince of Island, and they passed the Archives Act, giving us a national archives. So this was also, in 1964, a sense of creating this PI identity, um, you know, or I shouldn't say creating, it was already there, but cementing it with, by making these symbols, making these ideas official, and by creating an archives, making the collection of our history official, and not just kind of the pastime of, of people who were interested, but actually it's making something that the government had an official stake in. 
so you can see, and that reflects, you know, it's not like, as I said, the flag debate was happening in the rest of Canada, so this was something that was, you know, fl the flags and the coats of arms were something new. We were part of that identity building process. But the fact that it comes in 1964 is not a coincidence, obviously. But so with all this success, with all this strong and strengthened sense of island identity and island purpose, and uh, you know, and perhaps a stronger appearance on the national stage, you know, island, they become very interested. And some of that is is also the fact that, of course, in the 1960s, what we're seeing is that planning mentality, that economic planning mentality coming in. Keynesian economics were, of course, uh, at the top of their form at that point. Uh, and more and more, the government was hiring and growing and hiring more technocrats, more uh, bureau bureaucrats to try to organize the economy and think of ways to do that. And this is when uh, I call it the age of acronyms. Suddenly you have all these acronyms forming, right? I'm just going to list a couple of them here. Uh, of course, the province created a tourism, tourism department in 1960. And they created um, an Economic Improvement Corporation in 1967, the EIC. So already you've got it happening in the province. But at the federal level, it's everywhere. Because the, at the federal level, the government really starts to look at how can we deal with areas of the country that are economically behind, right? There's a lot of areas in Canada that were not doing, they weren't sharing the prosperity that other areas were. And PEI was one of those. So the notion was, how can we do that? Well, maybe it's through good planning. And they were looking at, they were forming groups like the Atlantic Development Board, the ADB. And uh, they passed the Agricultural and Rural Development Act, also known as ARDA. Uh, then the Fund for Rural Economic Development, FRED, came around in 1966 and designated PEI as one of five areas in Canada chosen for comprehensive long-term development planning which is really uh, kind of interesting. So they literally chose the entire province as an area for comprehensive development planning. And comprehensive development was this idea that you would attack everything all at once. That you didn't just like do a little precision targeting uh, to some aspect of the economy, but instead you hit everything. You looked at the whole picture. It was kind of this holistic approach to economic development. So that meant it was big spending, right? Because you can't do that on just a few bucks, right? Or on a whim and it involved a lot of planning. It also, uh, at the time, perhaps involved less consultation than I think a lot of islanders would have liked, um, because a lot of that direction, you would have people develop these huge plans, and then say, here's the plan, we're going to implement them now. And of course, what could sometimes happen is people could become data points rather than human beings in that plan. Um, but what happened with PEI, one of the reasons it got chosen for Fred, uh, the Fund for Rural Economic Development was because uh, you had to not only be kind of economically behind, you also had to have potential for growth in at least a couple of different industries. So they identified, and Fred, uh, the Fred identified the growth industries as agriculture, fisheries, and tourism as the, center, the main ones. Tourism uh, was seen as having perhaps the most potential for you know, growth, uh, and that was understandable because it had grown explosively since the post-war era had begun. Uh, and Alex Campbell uh, kind of became uh, a, you know, enamored with this modern process. And that led to, of course, negotiations with the government to develop what became known as the Comprehensive Development Plan. That was a direct result of Fred. So that Comprehensive Development Plan um, was meant to modernize the island. It was meant to bring the standard of living on PEI up to the rest of the country. And it was meant to allow islanders to have a more uh, modern existence. But of course, that begged the question, uh, well, what happens to the island when you do that? Does, is it still the island? Uh, and when it comes to tourism, it's kind of a snake eating its own tail, because the island is popular because it seems anti-modern. And maybe that will give us the money to modernize. And then how do you keep the tourism industry going if the island doesn't look, it doesn't have that anti-modern appeal. So it was this kind of circular thing. But the other thing was that, of course, many people liked, you know, many people who lived on the island liked it, uh, you know, for reasons that, that were looking to be disrupted by that modernity, right? Um, because one of the things the Comprehensive Development Plan called was for huge reductions, the number of islanders doing agriculture and the number of islanders doing um, fishing 
and moving at least some of those into tourism, uh, and the island becoming much more of a service, a service economy. Uh, and that didn't sit well with many people. So already there was resistance to the plan, and as many of you will know, and I'm sure Ed will talk about, there was a lot of backtracking, um, you know, eventually by the mid-1970s, by I think 1972, um, you know, that I think that Campbell had heard this and kind of started to walk back kind of that modernity language and was talking a lot more about maintaining the island's culture. And for example, the Comprehensive Development fan Plan went from kind of supporting huge, big-scale agriculture to focusing on maintaining family farms and things like that. So there was this shift, and that's coming up right up to 1973. Um, and also, there was less emphasis on tourism. Um, I'm sure and we'll talk about the notice that was sent out in the early 1970s in the newspapers. Uh, very condescendingly telling islanders how to be nice to tourists. Uh, you might have heard that. They speak slowly and clearly so your accent doesn't get in the way. All those kind of fun things. My sister's actually got a photocopy of that and that frame up in her house because it's just it's funny to read. Um, and uh, and so I think that was a real uh, challenge for folks uh, and provoked a lot of resentment. So 1973 uh, is coming. It's the 100th anniversary of PI Joint Confederation. And I think, again, the island's tourism promoters, the island's political elite, uh, and just, uh, even federal politicians see the opportunity to repeat 1964 and have that same national attraction, pull people in, uh, try to make it, uh, you know, try to make it a big celebration, try to increase tourism numbers, and try to pull in federal money. And so it seems like uh, a no-brainer. It seems like a slam dunk. Let's go ahead and do that. And so work begins. Let's see if I can get on the 1973 celebrations. And again, it's the same thing. They create a commission to start working on this. And they uh, that commission again is, consists of the who's who. They gather together hundreds of volunteers from across the island. They organize community days. Uh, there is so much swag built. Now, this is one of my favorite pieces. This is actually in our collection, and it is a whiskey holder. You take the hat off, and you can pour the whiskey out. It's a Father of Confederation whiskey holder. And then beside you have the official mascot for 73, the Smiling Father. And he also had kind of a cartoon version that would appear uh, from time to time, as well as the more kind of logo version with the PEI 100 on his hat. Um, and in many ways, the Centennial was a huge uh, success. We had, uh, we had all kinds of events, but there was this increasing voice of dissent that really didn't exist in the same way in 1964. It was a more organized voice of dissent at one point. Lorne Bonnell, the then Minister of Tourism, uh, said that uh, we're not going to stop for the wet blankets of society. Uh, but the fact that he was even having to say that kind of pointed out that those wet blankets were getting squelchier, louder, I'm not sure what you'd call that. Um, nonetheless, perhaps, uh, and you know where I'm going with this, if, if you know anything about this era, perhaps the strongest manifestation of that resistance was the brothers and sisters of Cornelius Howard. Um, the brothers and sisters, oh, let's see if we can get it, there we go. Mm -hmm. uh, they, of course, did not like anything about tourism. They did not like the transformation of the island. Again, they also loved the garden myth, and they bought into it. And they said, we are a proud country of farmers and fishers. We work <coughs> for a living. We are, you know, earn our living with, or we live our life with dignity. And they felt that tourism, for the most part, <coughs> was not a dignified existence, at least not the way it was being put forward by the Comprehensive Development Plan and through, uh, and through the Centennial. They, of course, also felt that the island shouldn't be tying its horse so strongly to this notion of being kind of Canada's mascot. And they felt that perhaps we should be, consider ourselves more independent. So Cornelius Howitt was celebrated. And Cornelius Howitt, of course, was one of the last members of the island legislature to vote against Confederation back in 1873. So they made him their superstar. Uh, they wrote letters to the editor. They created uh, the frowning father of Confederation. Um, and they told the story of the, of the um, PEI-faced kid, pie-faced kid, who does battle after being mistreated by some tourists, 
Besides, he's going to make tourists' life awful. And uh, for example, he uh, leads them to a gravel quarry when they ask for directions. He does things like this. And eventually, the frowning father of Confederation comes after him and almost manages to capture him with his feared centennial pin. Um, so it's, it turns into a wrestling match. So this was the kind of absurd comedy. And they held, uh, on the day, they, held, they put black crepe on the doors of Province House uh, and to, when it was handed over to Parks Canada as kind of a, uh, you know, to mourn the loss of our legislature as an island, solely island-owned space. Uh, they also had a plebiscite on whether we should separate with the question. I think the answers were, I, I don't have it in front of me, but something like yes and yes, definitely, I think was those were the <laughs> So it was, they were really just, uh, they were poking fun, but were also very, um, I guess, very serious about it. And did, did lead to responses from uh, the premier, who even said himself that, uh, that he believed, uh, he understood what they were trying to do. And he said, I think he said that, I don't think they're asking us to go back to the old days pre-electrification. I think they're asking for a different vision for the future. And I think that that was kind of the bait that was happening. What is the island's identity? What is its future? And this is where you see that vernacular and that official culture clashing, but also just discussing and debating, because a PEI clashing is usually not too violent um, when it comes to this kind of thing. But what story are we going to tell about ourselves? What do we want to be? Obviously, we want the toilets to flush. Obviously, we want roads that are paved. Obviously, we want you know, modern services and amenities. But we also want to be Prince Edward Island as we've always known it. And what does that look like? And what do we want to, and yes, we want to be good hosts. Islanders have always been good hosts. But how do we want to attract tourism, right? That's kind of thing. One other one I forgot was that when the Vacation Land 1 and 2 were built, those two ferries, they uh, had an official rechristening ceremony where they called them the Coney Island 1 and 2, uh, which kind of indicates to you. And there was, of course, official responses from the government to this. There was legislation passed in the 1970s to prevent um, you know, too much uh, land purchase on the shoreline by non-residents. And there was the banning of billboards to prevent the island countryside from becoming kind of full of those uh, sorts of advertisements. So the brothers and sisters did have some effect, although I wouldn't say that was the only thing. There was, of course, I think, they were tapping into a wider current uh, of that. So the, the overall, was the 1973 centennial success? Well, I certainly say so. I think that, uh, again, there was a banner tourism here. But it really was coming on the tail end of about a decade of centennials. Right? You had 64, you had 67, then you had 73. And that's just here on PEI. Other provinces were having centennials from the 50s through the 60s and into the 70s as well. British Columbia, for example, had their centennial in 1970. Other pro Alberta and Saskatchewan were, I think, in 1955, had their centennial, or uh, not centennials, but 50 year anniversary. So there was all these um, centennials. And by the end of it, I think everybody was kind of tired of centennials. Mm -hmm. Everybody was uh, over their case of centennialitis. So I think that. In many ways, in that sense, 1973 was the last gasp, at least until, of course, 2014, when we celebrated the sesquicentennial. Uh, this is my son. Uh, we were visiting PI at the time, and he's crammed in between the 1864 um, there, crammed between the, the 8 and the 6. But I guess, yeah, what did it all mean? What did um, these events mean? And I, I think that's still being discussed and debated today. I think it does mean that islanders are very aware. Something that tourism has done for islanders has had to make us think. I think before tourism, it was very easy. And before this, it was very easy to not think about your identity as islanders. You just were islanders. But now when we're constantly presenting a story to the public uh, about who we are to visitors, we're constantly saying, come to PEI because we are A, B, and C. And this is how we do it. It means that we have to think a lot more about who we are and what makes us who we are when there are these concerns that um, the island might change uh, because of modernity. Uh, there's those things. And when we are constantly saying, well, why is the island important? Or why is it, you know, why is one of the re reasons, and one of them is um, as the birthplace of Canada, you know, I think that that also, you know, creates discussion. Of course, now the Confederation story has taken on a very different tone. Uh, you know, because now in 
2023, we are celebrating the sesquicentennial, but you're not seeing that same level of investment in a year-long party that we saw back in, uh, you know, back in 1973 or 1964. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. You know, Vienna certainly hasn't helped, you know, get celebrations off to a start, and there's other things, you know, other things going on, other factors such as the pandemic. But I think there's also the fact that the centennials just don't, are they the Confederation theme doesn't hold the same kind of pure allure. I think in 1964, most Canadians saw it as an unalloyed good. It was a way for um, Canada to feel good about itself and to create a separate identity that was neither British nor American, and kind of it was it was part of that part and parcel of that. It really allowed um, the, the the country to kind of look and say, and you know, and there was a song I think uh, it was a Schuster did here in. And uh, I should have queued that up. I, I couldn't find it, uh, but I wanted to. I, I heard it once, and I think the lines were, they didn't start a war, they didn't start a fight, they just came down to Charlottetown, right? And so there was this notion that it was, uh, you know, that what made us unique was this very nonviolent, very calm and measured way of becoming, uh, you know, becoming a country, so to speak. And so I think that that was very appealing. And of course, what we have since learned is that while the meetings of Charlottetown might have been calm and measured, um, you know, and in some ways were very inclusive because they invited leaders of the opposition. It's hard to imagine that happening nowadays. Mm -hmm. On the other side of that, there was no women, there was no people of color, there was no working class people. Uh, you know, very generally, there was a lot of people that were not consulted before this all happened, and that resulted in a lot of violence to First Nations to Métis uh, and to other groups uh, in the formation of Canada. And I've studied some of that as well. My dissertation looked at the Riel rebellions. And that was, in some ways, a direct result of what happened in 1864 in Charlottetown and the plans that were made. Because part of those plans was, we're going to take over the Northwest. That's going to happen. And the way it was done, without any consultation, that was why the Riel rebellions happened in uh, 1869 and 1870, was because the BT said, no one talked to us before you declared Manitoba part of Canada, and we're not thrilled about that. We want to negotiate. And that was how that started out, and the same thing in 1885. Um, so those were a direct result in some ways of confederation. So I think now that's being rethought, that peaceful, you know, that, and it's not to say that uh, it's still very different than you look at, you know, America with the revolution and the Civil War. But it is something that I think, again, it's the story that we're telling ourselves. It's not that story number one isn't true, but story number two is also true. And I think it becomes uh, very complicated. And as a result, I don't think most people feel as comfortable uh, celebrating it in the way we would have back at that point in time. And to, to that point, we have an exhibition uh, at Beaconsfield right now, and also in Ottawa. We did it in collaboration with the, uh, we did collaboration with Heritage Canada, and that exhibition is a photo exhibition about uh, PEI's 150 years in Confederation. Uh, but the way we did it is we do, we just tried to share the story of 150 years of island achievement and of island connections to the outside world. So we do everything from the construction of the railway right up to the Confederation Bridge <coughs> and everything in between and tell lots of different stories. If you happen to be in Charlottetown, please go check it out on the lawn. Or, for some reason, you find yourself in Ottawa, where it's located right along the Chateau Laurier, and it will be there till October. So, but I think it's a very different, it's more of a marking, you know, I think uh, it's more of a marking of a, a passage. Uh, you know, we're, we're now 150 years as a province, and I think, I think centennials and other kind of anniversaries like that are always a tremendous opportunity for people to look at where they've come from, maybe where they are now and how those two things are related and then consider how that relates to where they want to be. And so I think that that's something that, um, you know, that 2023 can still be very good for. And I think that we can still celebrate that. And I think it's very uh, interesting to look at the different connections you see here between national identity, island identity, between economic growth, and of course, just the tourism industry in general, that all kind of come together and meet in these two centennials uh, here on the island. And it shows you how complicated those processes and stories are and what weaves in and out of them. 
and that the results can be very far-reaching and go on for a long, long time. For some, and I think the other thing to always note, too, is that personal side of history, because for many people, um, you know, many people have very fun memories of remembering when the queen came or remembering the celebration in their town. And I've, I've had conversations or interviews with some people who have very fond memories of those celebrations. Or, for example, we recently got a scrapbook that someone prepared of the 1973 year. They, they, they found it, it was their mother's, and they were in Calgary, but they sent it back to us to keep. And it's just it's a fascinating scrapbook of someone who clearly was just thrilled to follow the events play by play. And I think that's another thing we forget about centennials. That is a really a way for people to feel involved in their community and to learn their story and to connect with things. So I think in that sense, I, you know, if you were to say, should we stop having centennials, I'd say, no, absolutely not. I think we should keep going on. But what does it all mean? Well, that's something that we all have to kind of collectively decide. Thank you very much. You're willing to take questions from the floor? Absolutely, yes. Yes. Are there, are there, anyone have a question? Uh, could you comment on the importance of the PEI Museum Marriage Foundation being established in 73? Absolutely, yeah. And you know what? That's it's funny you mentioned that. I was considering whether to make that part of it, but decided I didn't want to seem like I was shilling too hard. Um, <laughs> but yes, absolutely. I mean, that was, uh, I mentioned the Flag Act and I mentioned the other ones. And another thing was the, the Museum and Heritage Foundation had actually been founded in 1970, but the sites were handed over, they were bought by the province and given to the foundation to run in 1973. Four of the sites you had, of course, Green Park, uh, and then you had uh, Beaconsfield, Orwell Corner, and Basin Head were the four sites that initially made up the Museum and Heritage Foundation. And again, it was that uh, I think it was you know to it's commend to Catherine Hennessy who worked so hard as the first director of the Museum and Heritage Foundation, or I think it was just known as the Heritage Foundation at that point, to uh, build up and build capacity for that. Uh, but it was also I think another part uh, that the Centennials did is they raised awareness of our own history, not just that national connection, but it raised awareness of our own history and made people realize we wanted to preserve that and that there was, you know, for some people it was all about, oh, well, that's got value, touristic value. People are coming for the past, we should find ways to preserve it. But for other people it really was about that personal connection and as some of you will remember at that point in time, truckloads of antiques were being taken off the island. Um, and generally, there was a lot of concern about our heritage being bought up. So I think in that sense, it was a very prescient move by the government to do that, absolutely. And, uh, and I'm very glad that I now get to uh, care for those sites uh, as a result of the work that was done in 73. I don't know if that answers your question. But... Yeah, yes. I, um, nice presentation. Loved it. Uh, my wife and I are from Vermont. Uh, we bought a cottage up here. 22 years ago. In listening to your talk, comment and then a question. Sure. In listening to your talk, every time you say the island or PEI, you can plug in Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God. There's so much similarities. And that's actually one of the reasons we bought up here, was because we see a lot of similarities between the island and the way Vermont was. I don't know, when we were growing up, you know, some years back, some decades back. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we were here, and it kind of relates to what you're saying is, you know, how do you present the island? And you presented it a good job for us, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of, another little tangent here, the similarities, we're seeing it now from both perspectives. In Vermont, um, we, we now hear on the island, we are the tourists. In Vermont, we're the residents. My wife's is eighth, eighth, eighth generation Vermonter. Okay. Um, in Vermont, there used to be a bumper sticker, I haven't seen it for a while now, was, welcome to Vermont, but don't forget to go home. <laughs> 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 so, you know, and we really haven't encountered that much up here in the island, but there's hints of it occasionally. The question, um, Vermont, one of the reasons Vermont is a tourist area, Boston to the south, New York and Albany to the west, 
uh, Montreal, Quebec City to the north. Uh, you know, to the, to the east you get the, the Boston, again, the Boston Corridor. You know, we're kind of centralized to, you know, a massive population. The island, on the other hand, is at the end of the world, <laughs> basically. Um, has that been a consideration in island tourism? And in in how, how do you deal with that in island tourism? I don't know if it's ever been thought of. Uh, well, I, absolutely. I, I guess I'd start by you know making a pitch for coming back next Tuesday to see Dr. Ed McDonald's talk because he will cover all that with tourism. So some of it, I'll, I'll try to give the best answer I can, but some of it, you know, he will probably do a better job of giving the details on. <coughs> but I will say that yeah, absolutely, that has been a challenge since the start. Is um, is where the because you know even today, I'd say the biggest num you know it, by far by far the biggest proportion of our tourists are coming from the other maritime provinces, uh, followed by probably Quebec and Ontario, and then the United States. Now granted, we are still uh, accessible, that's the thing, if you're driving from New York or Boston, it's still uh, it's drivable, it is, you know, you, you're, you're gonna, probably going to stop elsewhere, you're not just coming to PEI probably, you're probably going to visit Nova Scotia or New Brunswick, and maybe you're going to stop in Vermont or where not, but uh, it is accessible, and I think with the, uh, the arrival of the car, that became a very big, um, that, that changed the game. And that's why also the Confederation Bridge further changed the game for BEI. Mm -hmm. You saw that burst, uh, that growth of tourism again. Although, of course, a lot of that tourism became, uh, you know, there was a complaint that people were staying less long because now you could literally drive across the island, come back, you know, go back to New Brunswick the next you know, that next day, if you want. For many, many years, an awful lot of island that went to Boston, the Boston states. Absolutely. And they're still coming back to visit generations later. Well, in Old Home Week, if the name doesn't give it away, kind of was originally designed to get islanders to come back to their old home. Uh, it was, uh, you know, and it was actually designed to be like an American fair, agricultural fair, because most of the people trying to pull back were people that had gone to what they called the Boston states, which was the whole kind of that east coast, the eastern seaboard, but definitely centered on Boston, where there was entire blocks of, you know, island where islanders just lived uh, back in the like late 1800s, early 1900s. But certainly, I think there has been a real attempt, and you see this in the 1970s, for example, one of the, the things, the Comprehensive Development Plan, is they tried to build these resorts on PEI, which we still have, Mill River and Brunel being the two examples, with the notion that these would serve as kind of growth centers, kind of hubs for the areas, because uh, that part of that was also to draw in more quality tourism from further away, right? Because you get people coming and staying longer and spending more was the idea. Um, that was supposed to be the plan. It didn't quite work that way. And it's really interesting because, as I said, the comprehensive development plan was this comprehensive plan. But literally a month after it was signed, they formed DRE, the Department of Regional Economic Expansion. And DRE uh, was built on this growth center model. That was what they believed in. So already, when the plan was signed, less than a month later, it was considered outdated in its economic model of comprehensive development. So already it was kind of in conflict with how the federal government saw uh, things proceeding. So, uh, and you know, and by different standards, the, the plan itself was either a failure or a or a success, you know, it was a moderate success or more of a failure. It did definitely didn't achieve all the goals that it had hoped to achieve, and kind of just sputtered out eventually. But I would say too that um, that part of that that was the question with tourism right from the start was how do we maximize that dollar? Uh, how do we draw tourism further away? And I mean, and you know, and where how do we reach them? But uh, while it doesn't have the proximity of Vermont. It still, I think, is close enough that it, like that, that the PI government to this day definitely tour, targets Eastern Seaboard tourists in the United States as one of, and that would be our biggest foreign tourist market here, 100% for certain, um, and still has a bigger market than, you know, if you look at somewhere like, um, like I lived in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and there it's a much smaller tourism market because Manitoba, Winnipeg is eight hours from. Minneapolis, St. Paul, the next largest city, uh, and then you go in any other direction, there's nothing. So you're competing for a smaller market of tourists that have to come a further distance to come see you. So it's it's uh, so the East Coast actually, although it feels far, is actually relatively um, 
relatively densely packed population-wise than a lot of other parts of North America. And so BEI's definitely benefited from that, but it's, it's, it's that sweet spot where it's remote enough that it feels like another world to a lot of people, or it feels like you've gone to a different place, but still close enough that you, know, you can get in your Winnebago and drive here. So. <laughs> Any other questions from the floor? You mentioned the four museums that you're responsible for. Yes. How were those chosen to be centrally controlled, I guess we're going to call that, that's compared a great, to most of the other community museums that exist? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't know, I haven't researched the exact logic behind it, but if you look at the, what the museums are, I think that gives away at least some of the logic, which is you've got the Basin Head Fisheries Museum. You have Orwell, which had an ag it still has an agricultural museum and is a rural farming community. Then you have Beaconsfield, which is a shipbuilder's home uh, and also kind of like an example of beautiful 19th century high, you know, high Victorian architecture. And then finally you have the shipbuilding museum in Yo House, which is uh, the only one on, that was on far western PEI and again was the shipbuilding industry, right? And so what I think you have is you have museums because at that point, I think when you're looking at history, the history of industry was kind of a big focus, so that's what they focused on, right? You didn't have an Acadian museum or an indigenous museum or a museum of, you know, that, that was that would come later on. Um, and for this, for this, I think it was industry was chosen, and probably also thinking about spreading that again across the island, right? Because you have eastern, central, and western, uh, and of course, we now actually run seven sites as so the provincial museum. Uh, and those have just kind of joined on as we've gone. I haven't been able to find an exact rhyme or reason for the process of when the, the other ones have joined. But, uh, but yeah, it was definitely at the start, I think it was the focus of the history was, uh, was that industry and also finance and, uh, you know, and the history uh, often, like historic homes are usually elite homes, right? You don't go for, you know, you don't have the historic shack, usually, right? Um, and, and, or the historic outhouse. So well, that, I think, would be a great, great attraction. Um, so I think that, uh, so the, you had those kind of standard things and they kind of got one of everything. I'm still surprised that they didn't go for a lighthouse, but... Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what the exact logic was behind it or what the discussions were that allowed, that made them choose these ones and not others. So. Uh, Jason, do you have uh, I guess so. Um, do you think, uh, do you think, so the centennial and, you know, sacrocentennials, those are big events, right? <laughs> does PEI tourism, or does PEI in general need big events anymore? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a big question. I doubt I can answer that definitively. Um, I'd say that, um, that, I mean, big events do seem to be like, you know, if you think about it, we had two festivals in Cavendish like in two weeks. Uh, the Rock the Boat Festival was happening up at Green Park this weekend. We closed because, you know, people are there for the festival, not for the, you know, for the historic house at the time. Um, and we've just experienced festival goers kind of like showing up, looking to use the bathrooms. So. <laughs> yeah. um, it just seems that PEI, and sorry to interrupt, but no. like PEI tourism is like a steamroller now, right? Every year it gets bigger. You know, the only thing that knocked it off is the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And this year, I heard some little murmurs about some rough numbers for July, perhaps, but I think this year was, if it's not going to be the top, it's going to be next to the top. Yeah, it's going to be so, strong. I guess that's why I'm wondering, does maybe PEI tourism is just so strong, it doesn't need these big events? Um, I mean, yes. Uh, it's, I think that, and I think that, there, you, that you're right. I don't think that necessarily um, centennials are seen as the strategy for growing the tourism industry in a way that they might have been seen in 1964 or 1973. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a good point that I think the, the big celebrations, but of course 2014, there was, that was a very big celebration, right? That was, I think, uh, that's, at least for a little while, that'll be the last time there was like kind of an uncomplicated celebration of Confederation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then of course 2017, we had the national one. So I think there's still definitely, uh, I wouldn't say that it's economic necessarily, but there is a, uh, an urge uh, for lack of a word, or a, a desire to mark 
these passages of timing the centennials or sesquicentennials or, you know, I think there's a desire and, uh, you know, sometimes it does get economically tied in like this is an opportunity or even just an opportunity to share that story more widely and bring more attention to it, right? Um, I think that still comes into play. But it is a good question uh, and, you know, you might have to talk to our planners at the tourism department and see what their take is on it. Uh, the last thing I heard is now is that the big thing is experiences, right? You go and have an experience rather than just go and, you know, and uh, stay in a hotel and go to the beach. And have a, you know, whether it's, uh, I was mentioned the Lenox Island experiences there at the start, but we have them at Orwell too, where you can bake bread uh, and, you know, make butter and do things, like, you know, and do different, set, you know, exactly, learn square dancing and those kind of, uh, we had a we had a 19th century date called Courting at the Corner for a little while, you know, so those experiences seem to be quite big and, and people seem to like those as, more. As opposed to commemorating, I guess. In a way, you know, uh, 19, or 1964, 1973, come to PEI, enjoy, the, but also come to Province House. And, and, to come to that place, it's like a commemoration, I suppose. <coughs> Absolutely. But an experience, as you're just, you know, baking bread or, or whatever, it's not really a commemoration, it's more of a, oh, yeah. oh I feel so empowered or it's, enjoyable or something. It's kind of, yeah, experiencing the past directly by doing it, I guess, <laughs> no. would be the best way to say it. But, but yeah, no, it's a good point. And it also will be interested, and I'm just speaking in pure speculative terms now, to see what uh, it looks like when Province House reopens. Mm -hmm. And people can actually visit the Confederation Chamber again, and they'll have their new interpretation because there is. I know they're doing a lot of work on that in the background. That was supposed to happen this summer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have stopped counting. Oh. I do not know. It's going to open someday. Yeah. It's going to open someday, and we will all wait. Yes. So, I guess I thought um, that it was also about a sense of increasing the sense of belonging, uh, whether it was a per attachment to a province, attachment to a community, that they were also trying to uh, do with, I don't remember 64 too much, uh, but I do remember like 67 obviously, it was Canada, yeah. but 73 I remember in all of the various <laughs> days that happened in all of the communities throughout. Uh, throughout the province, but it was about belonging to the island or belonging to your community. Absolutely, and I think that, um, that that's another thing that these centennials have been used for, and you know, is that kind of a, a you could call it maybe this is a little callous, but building citizenship, like making you feel like you're a citizen of the island, buying into that that you know that sense of belonging, and and I think that uh, that's why I kind of read that part about. Um, about Leon, Leon Ross and the students and you know and so people like that was a real tangible thing uh, at these centennials it wasn't and so in no way do I mean to mock it or suggest it wasn't real uh, I think people had honest uh, you know and, and I think communities a lot of communities had these events and they were honestly very happy to have them and, and you know and you can see that when you look at things like the scrapbooks or you know you read these accounts of people talking about them that they were very meaningful and helped people, you know, and left a mark on people, made them think of themselves as part of a community. So yeah, I would agree 100% with that. That that was another, definitely another goal was building that sense of citizenship and uh, community on the island, for sure. I, I don't know, just to question another question, but my, my question is, um, is the, the tourism focus in the past uh, to try to develop tourism on the birthplace of Confederation being here going to become a liability to us in the next 20 years. And the reason I'm asking this question is your last, one of your last comments was uh, about the Red River Riot. And you know, you had the two, two versions of the story and so we're, we're all familiar with, with th this version. But, and I've been trying to figure out the name of the author. Uh, he's a uh, history professor or academic from, I think it's University of Saskatchewan. And he did, a, a, I read his book on um, Canada's first prime minister and, and relationship with indigenous people. And, you know, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you have the first story that's true. 
and the second story that's true, but we don't know the second story. And, you know, we had a debate about uh, removing the uh, uh, John A. McDonald uh, bench yes, in right. and, and at the time, I was, I was kind of thinking they probably shouldn't be doing that. But after reading that book, I was thinking, boy, uh, you know, how is it possible that we don't know the second story? And, you know, and I, I, I wish I could remember the, the author, but anyhow. Um, so I guess, you know, we're always going to cling on to that because that's our history and, and it's an important story. But story number two really needs to be developed and it, it's not going to be as, as kind to, you know, what, what we did. I, I think it's, yeah, I, I mean, well said. I, I, don't, I, I don't have any qualms with anything you said there. And uh, I guess I'd just add that, um, that yeah, it's, it's a tough thing um, because uh, that, that's the thing with history is that um, I think, and, and is that there's a lot of stories involved in history and it's really the ones you choose to focus on and when you talk about the John A. statue I think that's the thing uh, I've said this before in a couple of talks because uh, you know people sometimes say well if we take down a statue aren't we removing our history and I would say well no you're not removing your history when you take down any statue regardless of what it is whether it's a great statue or like uh, or something that should go down or whatnot you're not taking down your history because statues in and of themselves aren't history they're what a particular group of people decided was important from their history. And so that might be a good thing, or it might be something that, you know, or it might it might be really up for debate. But I'd say um, that uh, what you're talking about, where we have, um, you know, a pro first prime minister who has many achievements to his name, but also uh, has a history that has caused a lot of death and pain for uh, a number of, of people in this country, um, you know, when you have a statue like the one that we had in Charlottetown where he's sitting there with his arm out, very kind, very gentle, inviting you to sit down beside him, even if you were to put a plaque beside that that says, here's the other story, most people don't stop and read. Uh, you know, but, and this is one thing I learned working in museums. Most people don't stop and read. You can write the best text in the world. They'll look at the picture, and they might read a headline, and then they'll move on nine times out of ten. And so you're not really going to get that message across very clearly there, especially when it's sitting beside a statue that looks so nice and kind, right? So and, that, and then the question becomes, do we want to put up a nice and kind statue, like a statue that looks nice and kind that valorizes basically someone, if there's that second story that isn't so nice and kind? Or is there maybe another way? And the other thing to remember, I always thought it was great, someone did um, on the the app formerly known as Twitter, there was someone saying, they were they were doing a parody, but they said, we can't take down the statues of our first prime minister, then everyone will forget who Charles Tupper is. Oh no, it's happening already! <laughs> um, and, and the joke, of course, was that, and I'm not trying to, to weigh in heavily, this is just kind of just, uh, like on whether or not particular statues should be removed or kept up, but I think the point is, in that sense, is that, um, that Canada's first prime minister will always be Canada's first prime minister, and will always be in the history books for that reason. And will uh, and there is and there will always be historians who will study that person and write books about him for various different reasons. Um, and right now, more books are being written about the bad news than about some of the other achievements. Uh, but I think that the, that removing a statue or putting one up won't erase um, won't erase that history. It'll still be in the books that people can go to will still be taught in schools. And it's just that debate about exactly how it gets taught is something that Canadians have to have a conversation about. And uh, that debate about statues is something that will be ongoing. And it's happening across the world right now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or at least in the United States and Europe, at any rate. But it's, it's a really good, thoughtful kind of comment. And I don't have up, straight up answers to it, because I don't think anybody does. When well, I read community history, there are many references in those books to features that used to exist that no longer exist. Kind of like island directions. Quite frankly, are invisible. <laughs> and I'm just wondering whether the Museum Foundation is encouraging communities to at least put up a sign to say, this is where it was. <laughs> Years ago, I mean, in all honesty, we don't have a um, kind of like a plaque section in the foundation. That's not right. something we specifically do. 
Uh, but I mean, it is interesting to think about that like lost tangible heritage. We are very much advocates of preserving the heritage that exists. Uh, we, you know, we are members of the Community Museum Association. We certainly have um, uh, one of our staff members gives out, uh, you know, uh, heritage grants. Um, mm -hmm. That's not through us. It comes from the provincial government. But it's, it's a weird arrangement. They were they're in the provincial government, but they also form part of the foundation as well. Um, but anyway, I guess I guess my point is is though that uh, that like that's certainly an activity that that the foundation would support. Uh, we haven't been doing it in any kind of conscious like let's go out and do that sort of way. But it would be interesting, and this is just me uh, spinning to do a project to kind of like preserve some of those or like preserve those memories before they're gone. Well, yeah. your comment about the National Outdoors was <laughs> sparked my memory because where I grew up, there used to be a sawmill, a gristmill, and a 12-seat outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's nothing left. Oh, wow. I, that, I, I'd love to see a picture of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, we probably... This is to show our appreciation. It's, it's, uh, these talks are funded by the, the government's Prince Edward Island uh, Centennial um, 150 yes. Commission. And uh, so, uh, and I should say that this year it only was announced in February. You know, in terms of centennial, it was very late this year. There was no official planning beforehand, but <coughs> we jumped in and got ahead. And it, it, to show our appreciation, we give that to you. So Thanks thank you. so much for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to mention, um, make a few announcements. Uh, next, the next speech. Uh, in a week's time is the last of the series, as as uh, as you know, and it's Dr. Ed McDonald. He's returning. Uh, he he began the series uh, six five weeks ago with looking at the history uh, of the period, uh, the 1860s and 70s, and his talk next week is enshrined: Island Tourism and the Confederation Story. And I know he re reviews the whole history of tourism on the island. Um, the other event of the week uh, is the uh, on Sunday afternoon, uh, 2 to 4 in the afternoon, we're having our third annual Blueberry Social. Uh, last year, we it was a disaster, well, not a disaster, in fact, it was very successful. <laughs> it was a disaster with the weather. Uh, we were rained, uh, it just seemed that's those two hours of the, the uh, afternoon <laughs> rain poured, so we had to come into this room, and the number attending was about, uh, it had been 200 the year before, so it was down to about 100, uh, but it, we, it still uh, raised a lot of money because we, we uh, have uh, our seat sponsorships for it. So uh, tell your friends next Sunday, look at the weather, pray for good, good weather. <laughs> I'm looking ahead already, uh, and it's very unpredictable. Almost mm -hmm. every day this week, for the seven days, it, 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 it looks like showers. Um, so those are the, the two main events coming up immediately. Uh, we have, uh, Dawn is sitting there to sell raffle tickets. That's another fundraiser for ourselves. Uh, it's uh, the seafood raffle. We have... Uh, the 250, and I see Jenny, you, Jeannie, you were the winner of the 250 so uh, uh, last year, and uh, so someone will win $250 worth of lobster, and then there's $100 worth of oysters for the second prize, and $50 of seafood for the third. So uh, support uh, if you haven't already done so through the lottery or, or the raffle ticket. Uh, memberships are available as well for the museum. It's another way of supporting our work uh, and also keeping up contact with the uh, work that we do through emails and newsletters, which are sent out uh, uh, through the season. And uh, 
So it also has support. We have at the back, uh, there are um, drinks available um, and uh, cookies. So ha have some refreshments before you go. And if you want to leave a donation, please do. So I want uh, to draw the evening to a close by again thanking Matthew. And so you will just relax and have a chat with each other. So thank you. Thank you.